Welcome to Graph Connect 2018. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> this right here, right now, the morning of Graph Connect is my favorite moment of the entire year. We have an absolutely amazing day ahead of us. As Lance mentioned, extraordinary content, fantastic speaker, really interesting. Uh, that every time at every single Graph Connect, the best part has always been the ad hoc conversations. And I think we're going to have a lot of those today. A couple of practical things before we get started. Um, this is the fifth floor. This is Graph Connect. Uh, we talk about graph databases, Neo4j. Uh, if you're here for the Google conference, <laughs> you're on the wrong floor. You should go to the third floor, and then you'll learn everything about the Google Cloud Platform. It's a great platform, my personal favorite. This, by the way, is when the marketing dude gets really nervous. When the first thing I start saying, I start marketing another conference <laughs> in the same building. <laughs> That's why these guys tell me to stick to the script. Um, but the conferences are actually related, as it turns out. Um, as probably all of you know, the key innovation that created Google in the first place was PageRank, uh, a graph algorithm, right? So the way to think about it is actually, if you want to use the tools and the te technologies and the amazing products of the current Google, go to floor number three. If you want to learn how to build the next Google, go to floor number five and stick around here and learn that today. So that's how to think about it. So um, I keep it very simple for my talks. Uh, I have uh, one really, really strict ground rule, uh, which is that I do not want your undivided attention. Um, we are online. Uh, we have hotel Wi-Fi here, which we all know is a really high-quality product. Use it. Test it. Um, tweet. Uh, Facebook. Um, WeChat. Snapchat. Um, uh, let us know how we're doing, good and bad. Uh, the only thing that I do ask of you is that you use the, either the Neo4j or the GraphConnect hashtags, because uh, we monitor uh, those uh, obsessively. So a um, couple of good things that Lance said. One of them was uh, uh, know your audience. I thought we'd, we'd, we would start there. Um, hands up uh, if you have actually used Neo4j, hands on. Uh, please raise your hand. Wow, most people, fantastic. So uh, keep your hand raised if you're currently developing an application with Neo4j. Uh, and keep your hand raised if you're, you're currently using Neo4j in production. Probably 20% or something like that. Fantastic. Um, so I actually think we had some, uh, a little bit of, uh, of fake news going on there uh, at, that, at that question, because I actually think that every single one of you in this room have used Neo4j at least this week. Uh, is anyone staying at the hotel? Hands up if you're staying at the hotel. A few people. Every single uh, hotel booking reservation that you're doing at either a Marriott, like a Marriott proper, like this one, or Courtyard, or any of the Starwood properties, or like the Ritz-Carlton, anything owned by a Marriott, is done using Neo4j. Right? Did anyone fly here today? A few people, mostly local, but no, a, a fair amount. 99% of all airfare calculations in the world are, used with, are, are being calculated with Neo4j. 99%. Pretty amazing. Did anyone uh, take out any cash? You used an ATM this week and raised? So in Sweden, there would be like no hands raised at this point. But <laughs> there's still. So 20 of the top 20 US banks use Neo4j today. So chances are very, very high that without you knowing it, you've been using Neo4j uh, today. Um, so what Th that was some, a couple of examples of people who used graphs to solve a specific problem, like be it hotel reservations or airfare calculations or fraud detection or something like that. Um, and that's actually how we got started in the first place. Way back in the days, way back when dinosaurs ruled the earth, uh, and I first started dabbling with graphs, we had a very specific problem. We happened to be enterprise content management, where we had a lot of connected data, and we were held back by our existing data infrastructure. Um, and we thought a lot about what was going on, what was holding us back, why development was so slow, why performance was so slow. Um, 
and, and we realized that there was this mismatch between the data that we had, the shape of the data, and the abstractions that were exposed by our standard uh, traditional data infrastructure. This is the relational database, right? Um, and we realized after a while, like, hey, if we could just have a data model that is very, very simple, you have nodes and then relationships between those nodes and then properties on both of them, we, we can model everything. So we invented this data model that was exactly perfect for this problem that we were solving, right? So that's kind of one driver for it. We wanted to solve that particular problem. A, a second driver was that it also made a lot of sense to us. Like, it just felt like this was a very natural way of organizing data. Just instinctively, that's how we thought about data and about the world. It's, it's, it's entities and they're connected to each other, right? And then finally, the third thing was that we elevated connections, how things are connected, to be as important as the data itself. Right? Not more important, but also not less important, right? Like it had been treated in all previous uh, uh, data models. So we elevated that and we felt like putting c connections front and center, the world is very likely going to be increasingly connected over time. So it seems like this data model, or this, this approach to data is kind of on the right side of, of, of history. This was over 15 years ago, right? When we first ma ma made that, uh, uh, th those decisions. Fast forward to, to today, and that data model is being used everywhere. I gave you several examples about hotel bookings and whatnot. I'll tell you a couple more stories that inspire me right now. Uh, the first story is in the field of medicine. So uh, a year ago at GraphConnect here in New York, uh, um, in 2017, uh, we talked a lot about cancer research and the 12 plus independent projects that are using Neo4j to try to find the, the cure for cancer. Uh, today we're going to talk about a different field of medicine and a different disease, specifically diabetes. Um, and diabetes is a pretty horrible disease. It's uh, very prevalent today. Over 400 million people apparently suffer from diabetes. And not only that, it's increasing as well. So back in 1980, 4%, 1980, 4% of the population suffered from diabetes. It's now twice that, 8%. Uh, today. 1.6 million people die everywhere, uh, every year from, from diabetes. Um, and fortunately, there's been a lot of research in that area uh, for, for diabetes for decades now, which is great. Um, it turns out that uh, you can imagine kind of clinical uh, medical research is actually today a very data intensive uh, thing. And you can kind of think about it how you have some kind of clinical study, you study um, you know, someone with a disease and they have some symptoms and you study the cause and effect and you get some kind of result and you store that in, a, in, in some kind of a database, right? And then once you reach critical mass, you start analyzing that to try to find causation, well, uh, correlation probably initially and then ultimately some kind of causality, right? Um, and, and, th and that's great. Um, however, the challenge is that the body is a very connected thing and all the various components and subparts of the body affect each other, right? Um, and and the, kind of the way that it's being done today, if you look inside of these medical research institutions, is that they all have their data in silos, right? And that's great if you want to look at something very locally, right? So you might have a human being, right, who's participating in some clinical research, right? And so then you look at that and you study that and you find, you know, those correlations and causality in that local data set. And then in a completely separate data set, you have maybe some experiment, sorry, I shouldn't, some studies <laughs> of, of mice, right? And you look at uh, what that looks like, right? And then you study that, and then locally you can try to find what's going on there. But never do you correlate the two separate data sets, right? And there might be that there are some biological pathways and some metabolic pathways that are not dissimilar between human beings and, and, and mice. And if you can find that, all of a sudden you can see how this thing over here actually affects that thing over there, right? And this is the insight of uh, a research team in, in, in Germany at the German Center for Diabetic Research. And they realized that, hey, actually the diabetes now have gone beyond a data problem. It's actually now a connected data problem. And they're using Neo4j to do just, just that. Uh, so we have the head of data for the, the German Center of Di Diabetes Research uh, here today and is giving a talk on exactly this topic. So you think that is as exciting as I do, please check it out. I think it's gonna be a very, very interesting talk and with massive impact if, if they're successful. So that's my first story. Um, my second story is about Adobe. 
Adobe, so I'm uh, squarely in the, in the software space, obviously, so I don't know how many of you pay very close attention, but I've been very impressed with how Adobe has, has evolved over the past few years, where they've gone, been on this very big journey of transformation, where they, you know, they, their origin is as a classic on-prem desktop software vendor, right? And they transformed into an, to a cloud-based subscription software service uh, platform. Right, in a very impressive way as a, as a public company. Right? Uh, you know, as, a, as a software CEO myself, I've been very impressed with how they've done that. And Adobe is temporarily you know, a somewhat bigger company than, than we are, and managed to go through something like that is, is very impressive. At the core of that is what they call the creative cloud. And one of the aspects of that is what's called Behance. Behance is, uh, is I think of it as a community for creative professionals, right? where you have people who are, have users, right? and you can follow other creative professionals that maybe inspire you, and when you follow them, you get updates if they publish new content, you get updates if they comment on things, or you know, things like that, right? And then you can, you can follow them and tag along and see what's going on, right? If you peel behind the layers, they were struggling a few years ago because they had based this architecture on a very popular non-relational NoSQL database. Um, and the functionality worked great. People responded really well to it, but because of their data architecture, they ran into a bunch of problems. And those problems manifested themselves in several different ways. They had to batch updates, right? So if someone published something, you would only get it some amount of time later, maybe five minutes, maybe 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes. And you could just think of Twitter or Facebook, what, you know, what would happen to that if you couldn't immediately see what everyone was posting, right? So that was kind of holding them back. The recommendations were poor. Engagement was, was, was lower. Right? And it was also very, very resource intensive. It required a lot of servers. It required a lot of hand-holding and, and, and ops. Ultimately, they realized that, hey, this is a, actually a connected data set. Right? You, can, you can just see it here. It's, of course, very centered around connections. What if we replace this, this NoSQL database with, with a graph database, which is actually optimized for managing connections like this? So they did that. Um, they immediately were able to move beyond the batched updates and got a real-time view of their feed, which Im improved recommendations, improved engagement. Um, they also did this in, in a much more scalable and performant way, which reduced hardware. Right? So they actually went from 48 server, I believe, down to three servers using Neo4j and still performing and scaling, scaling better. It's a great story. Uh, David Fox from, from Adobe is here today, uh, and he'll give you a lot more details if you're interested in this. I, I think it's a, it's a fascinating case study. Uh, and Adobe is not alone. It turns out that seven of the top 10 software companies in the world now use Neo4j. And then the final story is the, uh, the story from the world of health insurance, right? One of the biggest healthcare insurance companies in the world um, they are, they're active in over 30 countries. They're massive here in the, in the US. Uh, all of you would, would, would recognize the name. Um, their entire business is actually managing networks, but it's networks of people and patients and hospitals and facilities and, and things like that. Um, the challenge for them is very, very similar to the previous stories in the sense that they ha they, they, their entire world was managing networks, but their data backends was silos. So all that data was trapped in dozens of vertical silos. What they are doing now is that they're using Neo4j to create the next generation data platform when they realize that, hey, our world is networks. What if we could look at our data as networks as well, right? The silos held them back, caused operational inefficiencies, uh, you know, slow claims processing. I'm sure none of you can relate to slow claims processing in, in healthcare insurance, but they had some problems with, with that. Um, and by moving to this new architecture where they were able to look at data the way it was actually naturally shaped and formed, they were able to optimize and, and make that uh, a lot more efficient. Um, Zooming out from them, I actually think that the entire world of insurance is based around networks. And I think over time, it's going to be completely re-architected around connected data. And in fact, even today, eight of the top 10 insurance companies in the world are using Neo4j. So looking a little bit more at that domain model over there, this I think is pretty intuitive. One of the things that we've talked about from day one with, with this is that graphs are whiteboard friendly. And that was the observation that we did way back when, when we showed our data model, 
to domain people, people who are experts in something else but aren't computer science geeks, who doesn't, they don't know anything about third normal form or ER diagrams and, and stuff like that. And they look at this on a whiteboard. It makes sense to them, like there's a patient and they're treated by a doctor who works at a hospital. This, this makes intuitive sense, right? In the graph world, we call these circles, we call them nodes, uh, we call the arrows between them, we call them relationships. And then on top of that, we have these key value pairs, the, the properties, and you attach them to both the nodes and to the relationships. And with those three super simple building blocks, it turns out you can model everything, right? And that's the core of what we're doing here today. All right, so um, let's take a step back and talk a little bit about the industry, right? So this was some examples of what's going on right now in the world of graphs in terms of um, customers and users. Um, what's going on for us as an industry, right? So there's a site out there that, um, I don't know if, if, if uh, you, you have heard of it, uh, I pay close attention to it. Uh, it's called DB Engines, and it's a little bit inside baseball, but it's basically a site that tracks all these new databases. And they track actually over 150 database projects last time I checked, which that in and of itself is an interesting thing. When I got started as a programmer in, in the 90s, there were four databases that you could choose from, right? There was like Oracle, and there was DB2, and there was Informix, and Sybase, and that was it. This was even pre-MySQL, right? And arguably, they're the same, right? They're like, they're at least they're the same type of database. So really, your choice of database in the 90s was like a vendor choice, right? That was it. Fast forward to today, they track over 150, right, across many different categories. So that alone says something about the value of data today, right? Um, so they do a lot of different things. One of the things that they do is that they compute basically a popularity score or a buzz score where they, they look at Stack Overflow posts, they look at tweets, they look at LinkedIn job postings, LinkedIn scales, Indeed.com job postings, and a number of different signals like that, and they compute a score around how much buzz there is, how much talk there is about a particular database. And, and that's interesting, but what's, what I find even more interesting is that when they break it down per category, right? So with all the various different categories uh, in, in databases, here's how they've evolved since, the, since the 2013. And it turns out that graph databases have actually been the fastest growing category in all of databases since 2014, which I think is pretty amazing. We see that at Neo4j. Uh, today, 76% of the Fortune 100 are either using or piloting Neo4j, which is, a, I, I, I don't know the exact number, but if, I, if, if, you, if you'd been at Graph Connect in 2015, I think that number would have been zero, right? This is happening very, very, very fast. Um, and in fact, many of the leading organizations at some of the biggest verticals in the world are using Neo4j. I mentioned 20 of the top 20 US banks, 20 of the top 25 global financial services institutions, right? Uh, three of the top five logistics firms, seven of the top 10 retailers. It's pretty extraordinary. Uh, graph adoption in the enterprise is no longer a theory, and I hope it is very much here. So what are people then doing with graph databases? Um, well, we've talked about a number of different use cases, and, and the challenge with use cases is that in some way they kind of limit us, right? Because what we have is fundamentally horizontal technology. The use cases are wherever you need to work with connections in data. When you don't want to ignore how things are connected, you can use a graph database, right? That's the, that's the ultimate expression of the use case, right? But how does that impact the business, right? And we've identified top six, and this is probably today, I would imagine between 60 and 65% of all graph adoption, at least commercial graph adoption, belongs to, some, to, to, to these six use cases. And uh, the first one is real-time recommendations. Uh, and that's basically, if you're a big retailer, again, seven of the top 10 retailers in the world are using Neo4j. Um, and of course, your entire, it's kind of the tectonic shift in your industry right now is going online, right? And when you go online, Amazon, sorry to mention, uh, if there's anyone in retail to mention a forbidden word, <laughs> but uh, Amazon has taught the, the world that you need to do recommendations. So other people have bought this, also bought that type thing, right? And it turns out that that's really very well suited to connect the data, right? You know, uh, if you look at um, like a big purchase list, a tabular form is one way of looking at that. But if you take that exact same data and you actually look at it in a, in a graph form, you see that 
This is Emil. Emil has bought these three items, and here is someone else who's also bought those three items. So let's let's take that and take the fourth item that Emil has bought and recommend it back to that person, right? Because probably they have similar taste, right? It's a very very simple collaborative filtering recommendation or an open triangle recommendation. It's one or two lines of cipher in in, in Neo4j. Um, it's a very popular use case. Um, fraud detection is also hugely uh, popular, I'm sure, uh, here in New York. There's several people from the financial services industry. Fraud detection is uh, very popular in financial services. Uh, it's basically being able to capture fraud rings where you have a number of transactions that in and of themselves are, are okay, but they're connected in a way that isn't okay, that is fraudulent, right? If you can't work with connected data, that's really hard to detect, right? And graph databases allow you to do that. Network and IT operations, it's kind of obvious in a sense, right? If you're a big telco, your entire world is about managing networks. It's kind of the equivalent of that healthcare insurance thing, right? But it's physical networks. And you want to make sure that they're up and running, so you want to do root cause analysis, you want to run what-if scenarios. Hey, if all of a sudden I have a dashboard and 10 devices stop working at the same time, is that because all of them mysteriously fail at the same time, or they may be connected to one power unit, or they're connected to one firewall, or something like that, right? Figuring that out requires to you to have a model of how things are connected, and that's obviously you know, a good fit for, uh, for graph databases. Master data management is a very broad use case. It typically breaks down into customer 360, being able to get uh, a consistent view of how your individual customer is connected both to internal systems and to external systems like social media. Um, and data lineage, which is also very popular in financial services and in, also in government in heavily regulated industries. Um, knowledge graphs is a topic that we'll spend some time on, on later, uh, so I won't d d dive too much into it uh, right now. And then identity and access management, which is about keeping track of how you relate to content and assets that you may or may not have access to and how, which groups you belong to and, and so on and so forth. So it's been interesting to see in, in recent years, it used to be that we were brought in, um, maybe not 100%, but absolutely most of the time we were brought in as a very specific point solution to a problem, typically one of these problems. That's typically how adoption started. You have a recommendation engine project, you have a fraud detection project or something like that. Um, what we're starting to see now is people having success with that first use case, and then we st start seeing more and more use cases inside of the enterprise. And it's sometimes the same use case, right? It's sometimes a re recommendation, but for another part of the business, for example. But more commonly than that, it's another use case, right? So today, almost half of our customers actually have one, two or more projects, uh, which I think is pretty interesting. Another thing that we see now is where we're getting brought in not to solve a specific point problem, but more as a generic data platform technology. When people realize that, hey, there's a lot of value if I put, put data in this platform where I can m maintain the connections, and we get brought in not to solve just a, a narrow thing, but as a, as a broader strategic platform. So one example of this, there's a number of, of big global communications companies right now that are using Neo4j as the platform to back their entire smart home uh, initiative. And obviously, you, I mean, there's a lot of slices of use cases in there, but ultimately it's the one data backend that connects all the data. Right? Um, this is something that has been very interesting to see evolve because as you get more data into, the, into these databases, it enables more use cases. And in fact, it leads to what's called a data network effect. And for all of you here in this room, we know that network is a, uh, is a synonym for graph and graph is a synonym for, um, for, for networks. So that's obviously very related to, to what we do. Uh, but it's this phenomenon that when, that when you have a product, that becomes better the more data that it gets, but it, that product in itself also generates more data. So you get this virtuous cycle that ends up driving a lot of product usage, but also a lot of our uh, deep penetration within these customers. Cool, so what's then enabling all of this? So a year ago here at Graph Connect in, in New York, um, I was on stage and uh, I announced um, uh, a broader vision for, for the company. Up until that point, we'd been squarely focused on, let's call it the OLTP of graphs, right? The Oracle of graphs, maybe. You know, a, connected, like a database for connected data. Um, but we felt that what we observed was that when we talked to many of our customers, both big and small, 
we saw that many of them actually ended up re-implementing a very similar stack, right? They put Neo4j in there, but Neo4j very seldomly exists in isolation. We're part of an entire ecosystem of data technologies, and typically you want to have some data in your relational database and some data in your data lake, right? And so then people end up building this integration tooling, right? This glue to get data from your, maybe your data lake into Neo4j, right? And then a lot of people realized that, hey, that whole whiteboard friendliness that that dude with the Swedish accent talked about, that actually ends up being true. So even if I have this database, which is a very back-end oriented thing, if I could just show that to the business, like it would make sense to them, right? And that's really powerful. Um, and so then people add some kind of graph visualization on top of it, right? From a Linkurious or a Key Lines or a Tom Sawyer, right? And they add that on top of it. And then we saw that, hey, what if we could just take that, package it all up in one cohesive package and offer that to our end, end users? I think of it kind of as the, the LAMP stack, but for connected data. It should be like the one-stop shop for everything that you need end-to-end -to, -end to get up and running with, with, with connected data. We announced that a year ago. We said, hey, this is a multi-year vision. This is what we're going to drive the company towards over many years to come. This is not something that you, that you then spit out a quarter or two later. But we've been really hard at work trying to implement, to get to as close to this as possible. And I'm really excited to be able to tell you some of the, the, the progress that we made in, in, in this year. Um, and um, I'm going to invite up to stage uh, the, the person who is the absolute best on the planet at describing this journey that we've been on and the, the progress that we made for the graph platform, on, on the graph platform, which is none other than uh, Neo4j had a product, Philip Rathley. Please give him a warm round of applause. Thank you. Thanks, Emil. Welcome. Thanks to all of you for coming here. I'm going to give you a quick tour of what's happened in 2018 with the Graph platform. At the center of all this, of course, is the database. In May, we released a new version of Neo4j, version 3.4. Lots of great features in here. I'm going to focus on just a few. One, of, one important one is multi-clustering, something we're quite excited about. And with clustering, something you've always gotten is the ability to handle high volumes of reads, um, high availability, and high performance. And when I say high performance, this is one of the things that you love and appreciate the most about Neo4j, as I'm hearing every day, is this, we often use the term minutes to milliseconds to describe queries that take minutes or even hours in other platforms and run in milliseconds or seconds in Neo4j. So clustering gives you all these three things together. What multi-clustering does is it builds on this concept for the specific case where you have multiple distinct graphs being managed in your database. What, what it lets you do it's to spread those databases out across different parts of the cluster so that you can have not only read scaling, high availability, high performance, but linear write scaling as well. This is something we feel is uh, becoming uh, quite important and useful across a number of regulatory scenarios. We saw GDPR uh, come out in the last year, and there are lots of cases and lots of reasons why you would want different data to be stored in different places and never the twain shall meet. Multi-clustering gives you that. Another feature that's been getting a lot of traction is bringing together the worlds of graphs and the world of 3D, ge 3D geospatial. The way it works is you essentially have a new point system. Uh, so this is a new data type in Neo4j that supports x, y, z coordinates. And you can basically take that and bring it directly natively into your cipher queries. What, the way you'd use it is you would say, here are a set of points that I care about. Uh, now all of my data is tagged with coordinates. And in a particular query, I can simply say, uh, what is the radius of the particular things that I'm interested in? And that'll either filter or you know, Cypher will find the right way to optimize the query and uh, bring back the points of interest inside of that particular set. So this is very powerful. I can take a recommendation and br bring into that um, not only uh, 3D space, but also uh, time, uh, where we made some improvement, improvements in 3, 4 as well. So a way you might use it is, let's say you find a building. And once I have the building, well, now I have the Z coordinates. So I have the elevation. I can find the particular floor of interest in the building. But once I get to that floor, I can actually rehome the coordinate system around the things in that floor. 
and get to the particular rack or the particular place on the floor that's of interest. A cool feature, I'd encourage you all to check it out and use it. Finally, you can never get enough performance. As much as performance is something that's uh, uh, valuable that Neo4j does well, uh, we're never satisfied, our engineering team's never satisfied, you can never get enough. A number of areas uh, in performance in improved with Neo4j. In fact, um, one, one of the multi-year journeys that we've been on is uh, taking the single biggest bottleneck for data ingestion and making it very, very fast, eliminating that bottleneck. And specifically, that involves using Lucene in an appropriate way, um, which, is, which is not for, um, for graph, uh, it's not well suited for ACID uh, high volume graph transactions. So what we've done is we've created our own native index structure. We did that about two years ago, and with every release, we've steadily been moving different kinds of uh, schema indexing into Neo4j uh, native indexing. This improved the performance um, somewhere between two and a half and 10x. So on average, you can expect a 500% or so improvement in uh, going from uh, a non, uh, in going to native in index backed um, Neo4j uh, data. Uh, big improvements there. And really across the board, including with Cypher, we've gotten a lot of unsolicited remarks from customers who've upgraded to 3.4 saying, all right, my application is suddenly running roughly twice as fast across the board. So uh, very happy about that. Um, so that's 3.4 in a nutshell. Let's continue around the graph platform and talk about graph analytics. This is an area that's gotten a lot of attention and it's not surprising. Once you have your data in a database, it's only natural to look at that data and want to mine it and say, what, what more information can I get out of it? And graph analytics is actually a, quite a rich area. In some ways, you could say that a lot of the transactions that you run are analytic, taking things that previously had to be done in batch, running them in real time. But here I'm talking about true, um, as a data scientist or data analyst, going in, understanding, analyzing the data, and using it for new kinds of things. Um, one of the three areas I'd like to highlight here is graph analytics. This is a whole new area in data science. Uh, well, not, not a new area, but a newly exploited area for many. Um, like em Emil mentioned earlier with, uh, with Google and with PageRank, um, that has the potential to change companies. Um, so this, what we've done in the last year is we took the Graph Algo library that we announced uh, here a year ago, actually, and expanded on it with a, uh, a number of new algorithms. And we took the algorithms that were already in here, and we made them faster. Uh, there are a couple talks on this today, and I'd really encourage you to go and uh, check it out and learn about this area and this new capability. Another one, which is not ready yet, but we also announced it last year, and it's, there's been ongoing progress on this, is bringing Cypher querying, bringing graph querying directly into your data lake through Spark. Another area that we, we are very excited about and that we're getting very close to. Th th you'll also find a talk on this today um, about taking graphs and, and, and tables and being able to interchange views between the two using Spark uh, with Cypher on top of all that. Again, very exciting work. And last but not least, and I'll say the least about this because you'll hear a lot more about it in the keynote and throughout the day, is the integration between um, graphs and AI. So lots here to talk about. There are a number of sessions. Um, and uh, I won't say more. Continuing the walk around the graph platform, I'd like to talk about this new product called Neo4j Bloom. It was freshly, freshly released this summer, and it addresses something we've been hearing about for years, which is um, making visual code-free navigation available not just to technical users, but to non-technical users. I've seen many of you go to the business and have the business look at a graph in the Neo4j browser and say, oh, I really want this, uh, this tool. Can you give me this tool? And of course, you can't do that with the Neo4j browser. You need to learn to write code and write Cypher. What you really want is something that's code-free, that's smooth, that's visual, um, where you can just explore and sort of you know, not worry about code, but just engage and interact directly with the data. Um, this tool is really meant to inspire uh, users, including non-technical users, to understand the, the data better as it applies to their business and directly experience the power of graphs. 
we're really excited about this. We have a Bloom booth um, and some, uh, some talks on Bloom throughout the day. One of the things that's most valuable about the platform is not the Neo4j technology. It's what you can build with it. And it's not just what you uh, build with it um, as an end user, it's what other technology uh, vendors and communities and projects build that you can then use. So you can actually, uh, you know, in, in addition to your data network effects, get some software network effects. Um, Lance and Emil have both mentioned, and I'll repeat it again, uh, we have lots of great partners uh, here at the conference today who can talk about the services and the products that they offer, including different perspectives on visualizing data, particularly when you have lots of users and you want to do more complex things. So uh, please check those out as well. That's uh, one of the most important considerations as we, as we build out the platform, is building it in a way that's extensible and leverageable and reusable. Now on that note, none of this would be possible without the language. And one of the, uh, so one of the foundations for all this has been the Cypher query language, uh, which is, which becomes a shared language for accessing graphs across all these different vendor technologies. And we've been working hard on making Cypher uh, and making graph querying and graph pattern matching universally available. And when I say we, I don't just mean we Neo4j. I mean we, the technology community, by which I mean other, uh, other technology vendors, academia, and the end user community. And there's been a lot of work happening over the last few years around this, uh, and quite a lot this year, and we're learning better and better how to work together and what you, the community, needs. Um, it's very clear that you need a universal language uh, for this to be become an increasingly useful category. And there's been a lot, of, uh, a lot of great progress on this. In fact, more than 1,600 of you voted earlier this year and told, uh, told us that what you want is the vendors to really get together and start moving this towards a process of formal standardization. Um, uh, very happy that we're you know, making a lot of progress on learning how to do this, uh, both to evolve the language and to agree to, to um, how to do this together. Um, if you want to catch a glimpse of where this is going and how this might look uh, in one, two, three years, I'd invite you to attend a couple sessions. Uh, one is by uh, one of our guests, Keith Hare, who's the chair of the um, international ISO uh, SQL Standards uh, Committee for the, uh, for the uh, international division and the co-chair of the uh, American ISO SQL division, uh, sorry, uh, committee. And, uh, and also the talk by Alistair Green and Stefan Plantica about the um, bringing together uh, Cypher uh, into the world of Spark into your data lake. Uh, an exciting area, and there's a lot of movement uh, happening here and a lot uh, you can look forward to. Wouldn't be a proper Graph Connect if we didn't talk about what we're currently working on and what's next. So without further ado, Let's talk about Neo4j 3.5. There are lots of great things in this release. I'll highlight three. The first is possibly the most highly requested end user database feature that I've heard about in the last few years. It's also about bringing together different functionality, different languages, different communities and capabilities. And this is full text search. Um, we've been baking this little by little and happy to say that in 3.5 you'll be able to bring uh, the full power of full text into your graph, not just for your nodes, but also for your relationships. You can full text relationship properties as well. Next is we're finally completing this multi-year journey with um, moving off of Lucene for the things Lucene isn't good at. Of course, we're using Lucene properly for the things it is good at, um, which uh, namely is full text. And so th this is gonna make a massive difference for accelerated data ingestion so that you can get more data in to solve more kinds of problems and to benefit from those data network effects. And then uh, finally, last but not least, again, you hear community is the theme of the day. We're excited to make Neo4j more accessible and useful to the, uh, the Go community um, and with an official Go driver. And the way we've built this is actually um, 
the Go driver uses a new C connector that we call C bolt that's been designed um, to be the basis uh, to be a low-level driver and to be the basis for new drivers, and this is something we'll be talking to um, our uh, talking to our com uh, driver community about um, and our tech community about at the ecosystem summit that we're actually doing uh, this Friday, and um, uh, we can't wait to see what the com the driver community does with it and what new community drivers might emerge. So that's. Uh, coming out before end of year, uh, but you can go to our website now and download Alpha 9, which is the very latest uh, work in progress version of Neo4j 3.5, where just about all these features um, that are gonna be in the release have landed. All right, that's, uh, that's a quick review. Take advantage of the sessions today. There's lots of deep dives across all these different areas. Check out the booths, and uh, Emil, I'll hand it back to you. Thank you, Monsieur. All right, cool. Uh, so lots and lots of stuff there. And the, kind of the big thing that ties it all together is this graph platform uh, umbrella. If you, even though that was like <laughs> really compressed and a lot of information and a lot of features and functionality and whatnot, that actually just scratched the surface. If you found any particular piece of this particularly interesting, there is going to be a talk, a deep dive talk on every single feature that, that Philip mentioned, there's going to be a talk about today. Here are some examples of some of the talks uh, about various pieces of the graph platform and what, what Philip just, uh, just talked about today. I do not expect all of you to memorize or read that right now, but it's all in, your, uh, in, in the liberal brochure in your, in your badges. Switching gears a little bit, um, I'm going to talk and close with a, with a topic that is near and dear to my heart and that you've all heard uh, a lot about, which of course is uh, AI which many of you may actually be working in, um, and specifically, of course, how graphs relate to machine learning, right? Um, and this is a field that you know, we've been paying close attention to. Last year, I was on stage and I showed this graphic, or, which I thought was a, was a very useful, I, I found it on some social feed somewhere, but I thought it was a useful taxonomy of various uh, parts of the AI landscape. But of course, what struck out to me was that the way that they visually described all these different subfields was as graphs, right? So there is something very intimate about going on between graphs and, and, and machine learning. And the big, then begs the question for all of you who are working with some kind of machine learning, like how can you use graphs to, to make that, that better, right? Um, and the answer in a nutshell is very simple. What graphs provide for AI and machine learning is what it does for your normal software applications, which is the power of context and the power of connections, right? Um, last year, we spoke about one very central use case for, for AI and graphs, which is knowledge graphs, right? Here are four speakers who've spoken about their knowledge graph use cases at, at Graph Connect before, uh, since uh, 2015 and, and, and onwards. Um, I think gra knowledge graphs, there's a lot to be explored in there, but there's a lot of content out there already. It's starting to become a fairly well understood field, a very well understood intersection of graphs and, and, and AI. Um, so I'm not gonna spend uh, too much time on that today. Um, I'm gonna talk about uh, uh, more specifically how graphs impact machine learning. Um, and, and in fact, later today, there is no more than 13 talks uh, about machine learning and, and graphs. So you can, you can look that up in, your, uh, uh, in, the, in the agenda, and there's lots more information for you to, 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 look, to, to consume today when it comes to graphs and, and, and AI. Um, but so let's take a look at kind of a standard machine learning uh, pipeline that I'm sure many of you work with today, right? Um, and it starts out with some kind of data sources that, that you have, right? And then you extract data from that, you know, some kind of data records which we like to call features, right? You feed that to your machine learning, you train a model, that model hopefully predicts some really good things and makes some kind of decisions, and you know, off you go, right? Very, very standard. Of course, for all of us here in this room, we know that data is awesome, but like what connects individual data pieces is also awesome. And in fact, the world seldomly looks like that top row. It more frequently looks like this. It is connected, as I think we've said a couple of times on the stage, and you will hear throughout the day. Um, and so what's interesting about this is that so we're training these models 
to try to predict things, but we're kind of giving them, uh, let's call it a black and white view of the world. We're missing an important nuance, which is how things are related. And I think that's pretty crazy. And in fact, I'll go out on a limb and say that's scientifically crazy to do that. And I do that based on uh, one guy <laughs> uh, who has scientifically proven that that is crazy. That's probably me stating what his research is. I'm, I don't know if he would state it that way. Um, but the guy that I'm talking about is, uh, is a gentleman by name of James Fowler. Um, and he's a social science professor at UCSD. He wrote a really interesting book called Connected. He likes being on shows. This is him at some show. And this is him at some much more important show, which is Graph Connect in 2012, the first ever Graph Connect. He keynoted it. And he talked about his research. And his research is super interesting. What he's proven out is that He's researching various fields of social science, right? So one of the things he looks at is, um, is smokers versus non-smokers. He also looks at election turnout, what can get people encouraged to go to, go to elections and, and vote, um, and, and happiness, how does happiness spread in, in society? And one of the things that he saw that it blew my mind in 2012, this is quite a long time ago, right? Um, he said that if I want to predict uh, whether you are a smoker, and I have two options. I can either get all the facts about you, for us graph people, or the properties directly on the node, like all the facts about me, name, age, you know, medical history, you know, demographic, all of those facts, or I, can, I get to know whether the people in your graph are already are smokers. If I have those two options, I will be able to predict with much higher degree of confidence that you, whether you're, you are or will be a smoker with the second set, with a graph. And in fact, not even just your direct friends, but f not even friends of friends, but friends three, de three, three, three hops out, so your friends of friends of friends. So if all he knows is the friends of friends of friends and whether they're smokers, he will be more accurately be able to, with higher degree of confidence, to predict whether you are or will be a smoker than if he know, knows everything about you. That's pretty mind-blowing, I think. Pretty, pretty fascinating, right? But then, going back to why are we <laughs> training our machine learning? Like, what, like, the goal here is to be able to predict things and make decisions, right? So at the end of the day, this is probably not what we should be doing. What we should be doing is more akin to this, right? We should train our models and, and make them see the entire world, not just individual data records, but how things are connected, right? Um, this is called connected feature extraction, and there are three distinct techniques on how to do this. Um, and I'm happy to say that there are talks on each and every one of these techniques uh, today at the conference. Um, there's also a great uh, overview summary talk by Amy Hodler and Jake Graham that talks about, broadly speaking, how to do connected feature extraction using, using Neo4j. This is one of the four pillars of graphs and, and machine learning together with knowledge graphs. There's two more, graph accelerated AI. I don't have time to go into them in, in detail, but basically the observation is that there's a lot of sparse matrices involved in, in, in machine learning. And what at least I, I remember from my math class way back in the days is that you can look at any matrix as a graph and any graph as a matrix, and sparse matrices are really, really powerfully um, and more um, uh, uh, are, are easier to compute and more uh, resource cheap uh, to operate on as a graph. So that's what number three is about. Number four is, I don't want to choose my, my favorite children here, but like maybe the most fascinating topic to me, which is around AI explainability. Um, there's, that's about, I'm sure you've all heard of it, like taking that black box of AI and machine learning and make it more of a gray box, try to figure out why did it make the decisions that it did, why did it make the predictions that, that it did, provide some transparency and visibility into that. It turns out that there's a lot of decision trees involved in that, and I think there's a huge role for us in the graph community to play there. You saw Bloom and graph visualization, that's one way of visualizing um, these decision trees, which obviously a tree is a graph. Um, so those are the four fields that, where we see currently graphs being used in AI and, and machine learning, and you're going to hear a lot about all of them if you so choose uh, throughout the day. 
So that's kind of how we look at that. And that's a perfect segue, actually, to, to the next uh, speaker, who has been a huge uh, hero for me for many years. I first heard about her as the chief data scientist at, at Bitly. Um, she subsequently moved on and founded her own, own company, Fast Forward Labs, and is currently the, the GM of machine learning at, at Cloudera. She's done some of the most amazing, I think, writing out there on, on machine learning. And again, not to choose your, <laughs> your, your favorite children, but maybe what I at least found uh, some of the most interesting is, is uh, her writing together with DJ Patel. Um, on AI and ethics. And I'm sure she can tell you all about that. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Hilary Mason onto the stage. <laughs> Thank you yours. so much. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Thank you. Oh, you're awake. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. I've actually been a fan of Neo4j for quite a long time. I've used it in some of my own projects. Um, and I'm really excited to, uh, to join this community here this morning. I hope you've all had your cup of coffee. And for those of you who have traveled to be here, those of you who are watching on the live stream, I put a picture of Times Square up here so you can get a sense of where we are. Um, and I'm sorry for those of you who came to New York that you're here in Times Square all day. The rest of the city is really nice. I grew up here. I'm allowed to say that. Um, so uh, yeah, we're going to get started. Um, this is actually a talk about machine learning and AI, um, but also about metaphor. And if you take one thing away from my talk this morning, I want you to think about the way the metaphors we use to think about problem statements and the world that we're creating drive the architectural decisions that we make. They drive the design of our algorithms, and they, in fact, design they drive even our creative solutions to the problems that we want to solve. And so throughout this talk, though I am talking about AI and machine learning, I've chosen to highlight metaphors that have led to certain design decisions um, and, and try to give you some context as to why things are the way they are. So if you take one thing away from me today, it is that metaphors control the way we think about the world, and they are powerful tools for creating new kinds of solutions and opening up new opportunities. So before I move forward, how many people in this room are actively building something you would call a machine learning application? OK, we have maybe 30%. And so for the rest of you, how many of you think you may build a machine learning or AI application in the next couple years? Hopefully, that's the rest of you. OK, so, so I think this is a good topic for this room. Um, for those of you who, uh, who think machine learning is a buzzword, I think you're going to be very disappointed. It's my opinion. All right. So the first metaphor I want to share with you is, uh, is this one. This is uh, on the right side. You have uh, people on a train in the 1800s. You might wonder why. Um, it's because uh, that was the metaphor that led to the creation of the system you see on the left side. So, Herman Hollerith was a New Yorker in the 1880s, and he realized that we could not count the US Census uh, using the technology of the time. So they actually would send people to do it by hand on paper. It didn't work. And so he was inspired by the way that train conductors would punch holes in tickets on trains to create this machine that was an automated counting system. And you can go Google it. He wrote a patent, which unlike the patents of today, you can actually just read. Um, yeah, it's, it's clear language. Anyone can understand it. And it was a patent for this machine to count the US Census. Um, the metaphor led directly to the design of the technology. And another thing I'll point out here, which is a, a funny little side note, is that the punch cards that he created were the size of US Treasury in the 1880s because he got a bunch of postal or uh, currency boxes really cheap. Um, those punch cards, by the way, his company was called the Tabulating Machine Company. It, um, you know, uh, my favorite joke is from Vint Cerf, who instead of computer scientists named Kentucky Fried Chicken, we would have called it Hot Dead Bird. So his company, through some mergers, acquisitions, and marketing talent, became IBM. Um, the, that original punch card design led to the, the later design uh, that you saw in the 1930s, which has led directly to the architectural metaphors that we all use today in our computing environments. So here's one example um, of metaphor. We've been doing this data thing a long time, right? And today, if you look at headlines about AI, I'm going to show you a few of my favorites. Um, 
This one is about somebody who made a rap bot that raps like Kanye West. That's what AI does. Um, this is one I actually, uh, every so often I go to Google News and I type in artificial intelligence and I look at the, it's about half doom and gloom and half, uh, you know, the other side of things, optimism, you know, AI is curing cancer and by the way, it's also going to destroy society. Um, if you can see on the lower right of the screen, and by the way, this is from yesterday, so this, uh, this has not, this conversation has not progressed. We have a lot of work to do. Um, and here's another one that I like where a reporter set out to become BFFs with a chatbot. Um, and the way I'm, the reason I'm highlighting it for you here today is he said, you know, uh, the chatbot, the AI forgot my name. And of course it says in the chat transcript, if you can read that, you know, hey, um, what's my name? And it says, hello, undefined. Um, and of course nerds know why that is, but, um, but to normal people that might seem a little bit weird. Um, the reason I highlighted this example is because it shows the way that the vocabulary we use uh, changes the way we think about the technology. So we've moved from talking about AI and machine learning as computer programs, things we are all quite intimately familiar with and nobody really gets excited about except perhaps the people in this room, to talking about them like these uh, magical boxes or these creatures that are going to emerge from nowhere, take our jobs, they're gonna rap like Kanye West, and then they're gonna forget our names, right? Um, and so what I'm hoping to share with you today is a way to think about this practically. Um, and I am relentlessly practical in the sense that uh, I get very excited about things, but then like many of you, I actually have to go home and build them um, and they have to work. And that means that we need to have robust metaphors for talking about what we want to do before we can even decide on the solution. And I often find that in machine learning, it is posing the question that is the challenge. The answers are either trivial or impossible. Um, so, so when we think about the vocabulary today that we use around data, um, 10 years ago, we would be having a big data conversation, and that was really just the ability to get all of our data in one place and count things in that data, and that was it. Um, that was, I mean, it sounds very simple, but that was uh, absolutely transformative at the moment. It was not transformative because we couldn't have done it already. People have been doing this for a very long time. It was transformative because something that became inaccessible, it was inaccessible and incredibly expensive, and it became cheap and accessible. Um, and that opened up this entire uh, piece of work, new use cases, new applications, creativity around the technology. Um, that was 10 years ago in big data. We see the same thing happening today uh, in graphs. Once you can count things, you can count things for business purposes. You can do analytics. You can spread out the kinds of things you wanna count. You can put that technology in more people's hands. You're counting things for a reason. When you can count things cleverly, you have data science. So you can model things, you can predict, uh, you can start to look at things that haven't even happened yet and build representations of your data using different metaphors to explore the world. And when you can count things cleverly with feedback loops in systems that uh, appear you know, useful and magical, that's when you have machine learning and AI. But again, um, it's a peer that's important. The technology is just moving up the stack uh, but you cannot do it without being able to do data science, without being able to do analytics, without being able to do big data or have a fundamental data representation. So when you think about those metaphors, um, I would not dismiss AI out of hand, excuse me, but I would think of it instead as a new label for this technology where we've moved up the capability stack, where things that were previously expensive or out of reach have become possible in reach uh, and useful to a wider variety of people. And this is why we see this flowering of interest in machine learning and AI today. And I'll add also, it is up to us as technologists to make sure that people understand what is real and what is not. So what does it look like when we do it well? Well, I'm gonna share a couple examples, one uh, positive. This is one of my favorite machine learning applications of all time, and this is Google Maps with the traffic view turned on. Just to be clear, I don't work at Google, I'm just a fan of it. The reason I'm a fan of it is, what is special about this? It is really, really boring, right? So you can be driving down the road, you have to make a decision about which route you're going to take, 
Uh, you can look at your phone while you're driving a death machine. By the way, I live in New York City. I don't own a car and haven't in over a decade, and it, it, it seems totally nuts to me that anyone would. Um, and, it, and you can make this decision while you're driving uh, using this app, and you can figure out the best way to go where you want to go, and you don't think about it at all. You do not need to be even a little bit aware of the technology behind the scenes to power this. You don't need to know that every phone running Android going down the street is sending data back to Google, that they're doing incredible predictions using historical data with that real-time data. You don't have to know anything about the cellular tower network that is coordinating to stream that information down to your device. And you don't even need to think about the visualization because everyone who grows up in our society is trained that green means go and red means stop when you're this big. Um, and you can just look at this and understand what it means. So it's quite a successful machine learning product. And the most important thing about it is that we don't think of it as a machine learning product at all. We just use it, get where we're going, and then turn it off. And that's what success will look like. When we stop getting excited about AI and we start getting excited about what the applications we build actually can do for us. But this is really hard. Um, and it's hard uh, you know, even for the best people in the world at it. So I'm gonna share a quick personal example of being an edge case in this data-enabled data universe. Um, in 2007, there was a startup called Cool, and you can tell it's 2007 because Google Reader was in my tabs at the time. And they said, we're gonna defeat Google, and we're gonna do it by pairing images with uh, web page results. So images with text. Google didn't do this at the time. It was a big deal. Um, but that is my bio at the moment, and this is the actress, Hillary Mason, who happens to share the same odd spelling of the name Hillary. Um, in her later years playing the role of ugly hag in a movie. So this is really not very cool as far as I'm concerned. Um, and you might say, okay, that was 2007. It's a decade later, Hillary. Why are you still on about this thing? Um, I'm not that vain. So 2006, I think we are at this point. Um, Microsoft Bing, another company that has some of the top talent in the world. <laughs> Uh, in this domain, rolls out their, uh, you know, sort of celebrity um, visualizer inside of Bing search. And I, by the way, I'm not the celebrity. I am the nerd who happens to share the name with the celebrity. Um, so you can look at her bio. That is my photo, you know, for everyone. Um, I am not dead, just to be very clear for everyone in this room. Um, so even, again, some of the best people in the world at this, you know, struggle to bring the right data at the right time. And then a couple years after that, once again, I was looking up this movie, um, Robot Jocks, which is like a 1991 movie about a robot punching another <laughs> robot, and it is awesome. And um, of course, you know, there I am. Uh, thank you, Google. <laughs> um, and uh, I actually, I love that photo. Um, so I'm glad to see it pop up there. And of course, what, what do you do when this happens? You complain on Twitter um, and it got fixed. But then I was giving a talk a year ago and I thought, oh, this is a really funny example. I think I'll use it again. And um, you know, uh, okay, uh, there I was. <laughs> so um, the reason I bring this up is, uh, it's not just to talk about, uh, about how hard this is, but to say that um, even the people who are best at this in the world uh, struggle to do it well today, and that is why it is exciting. That is why we need these new metaphors, new ways of representing and thinking about our data. And we're waiting for the way that we think about technology to catch up to our capabilities. Um, so this is the moment to be where we are sitting today. This is why we should be having this conversation and thinking about the interplay between metaphor, how we think about the world, the architectures we decide to build. And many of the big opportunities to do this well um, are right here. And so um, one of the, the advantages I have from where I sit is that I get to work with a wide variety of people who are working on really interesting machine learning and AI applications. Um, 
And everybody thinks all of the cool stuff happens in startups, but I actually want to tell you that while a lot of the cool stuff happens in startups, it is people who work in businesses that have operated for some time, who generally have collected a large amount of data as a side effect of operating those businesses, who are also creative and ready to embrace these new metaphors for development, who have the biggest opportunities. And these people may be in Fortune 100s, they may be you know, researchers tackling really interesting challenges. Not all of the cool stuff is in little tiny companies that are highly resourced and highly data constrained. So if you come from a company where um, I met someone in the hallway this morning who was saying, you know, oh, I work for a supermarket chain, uh, it, that's, you're the right person to be here. You're the right person to be thinking about this. You have these big opportunities. All right. So I'm going to change tactics a little bit. That was my intro. And now hopefully you're thinking, right, this is machine learning. Now is the time I want to do this. Um, but I'm also supposed to tell you what the future looks like. And uh, if you do work in machine learning, you know that predicting is hard. And predicting the future is really, really hard. And so uh, when I got signed up to do this, I thought, OK. Um, you know, I'm speaking to a really smart audience. Here's what I'll do instead. I will tell you how we, in my applied machine learning research group, try to see the future. I'll tell you what we see. Um, and then I'm, I'm going to let you take that methodology and bring it back to your own work. Um, and so I hope that you will uh, tell me what you see as well. So at Fast Forward Labs, which is now part of Cloudera, so Cloudera Fast Forward Labs, uh, we do quarterly reports on emerging machine learning applications designed for real business use cases, which means that our team reads 30 papers, writes some code to try to figure out what will actually work at scale on the kinds of data that people uh, use in the real world, and then write that all down. So our goal is to be our customer's nerd best friend to accelerate the pace at which they can take advantage of many of these technologies. And that means we have to see what's coming. And we try and aim six months to two years ahead of what you will see in production. Uh, so given that, here is our, our secret. Um, first step, drink coffee, have ideas. Um, you can tell I've had a big cup of coffee this morning, but this is pretty much my usual state. Um, what I want to point out here is that you need to have a lot of ideas, and that means deliberately trying to have bad ideas. When I visit a company and they show me the, the machine learning projects they're working on, and they are all good ideas, I get very worried. Um, and the reason I get worried is that if you only pursue the things that are obviously good ideas, you are missing out on a lot of the opportunity for things that might be a little bit risky, but could have a huge potential payoff if you are able to accomplish them. So have a lot of ideas and then validate, so go as broad and wide as you can, and then once you have that collection, uh, validate against uh, criteria that can be fairly quantitative, and these are the ones that we use. So first, um, looking for active research activity that's relevant to a particular uh, machine learning application, that means are people publishing papers that are relevant? Are there papers in one academic domain uh, that could be moved into another? Uh, one of the advantages of having a team like we do where people come from so many different backgrounds, so we have computer scientists, physicists, neuroscientists, electrical engineers, um, and so on, is that uh, people have solved these problems in one field, but they didn't bother to tell everyone else. Um, and so when you get that kind of uh, diverse thinking in one room, you have a lot of creativity and a lot of uh, potential knowledge that can move from one place to another. Uh, second, is there a change in the economics of the systems required to architect a solution? Uh, meaning, what is the cost of, say, GPU, CPU, compute? I could draw the same graph for pretty much any of the systems we rely on. Um, and this one I found on Twitter, which I still find to be so compelling, which is the micro SD card, where the capacity has increased orders of magnitude over a decade. Same price, same card, same form factor, right? This world we live in is one in which if something is out of reach for you today, uh, don't throw it away because a year from now, two years from now, it might be cheap. Um, there might be some service you can just use to do it. Um, we look for capabilities becoming commoditized, particularly in uh, libraries and open source. Uh, Hadoop itself is the core example of something that was very hard and expensive to do, even though people widely knew how to do it. 
once the open source project became uh, reasonably widely adopted, you could take for granted that you could have that infrastructure in one place and you could count things um, and you could get an answer fairly easily. Uh, but we see this happening, like word to vec is another great example in the machine learning space where word embeddings are something very uh, mathematically complex and if you wanna write your own, it's gonna take you some investment to do that, some time and energy. Um, but now you can just sort of download them off of model zoo and you know, go off running in a couple of hours. Um, commoditization is a, a moving wave and it's hugely powerful for our ability to execute on machine learning. And the last thing is that data becomes available and this may be data that's internal. Um, it may be data you're generating because you launched a new product or launched a new feature. Um, it may be data you can collect from the world. It may be data that uh, you purchase, wherever the data comes from. You need data to be available in order to pursue machine learning. Um, the reason I have the Wikipedia page on data science up here is for two reasons. One is that Wikipedia is the dirty secret of every NLP application, um, at least run by startups, because it is widely available um, and the license allows you to use it for commercial purposes. The second reason is that the data science Wikipedia page for a long time cited the creation of the data science Wikipedia page as a major milestone in the evolution of data science as a profession. And that is the most Wikipedia thing I've ever seen. Um, and once you have your, uh, your uh, criteria, you go through that set of ideas and you say, okay, these things might be possible, these things probably not, you can progressively explore these capabilities. And so in our group, we do a uh, three hour lit review, which is really just Googling and reading abstracts of a bunch of papers to say whether we should or should not look further. Once we do that, we pick a subset do a, uh, read a couple papers, um, come to some individual point of view on whether it's worth the investment. Once we do that, we take the subset that pass that filter and actually go write code. Um, and so that kind of progressive uh, exploration allows you to consider things that are weird or risky and that might otherwise not be worth your time because you've bounded the investment of time you're gonna waste on it. Um, and two, it lets you have a way to repeatedly and uh, more importantly, depending on who is doing this work, uh, you know, get to the same answer no matter how many people are involved in the process. Um, just to show that predicting the future actually is hard, these are postcards from France from around 1900 predicting life in the year 2000. And they're largely self-explanatory. Um, but we still don't really have any of these things. So there's uh, like children in a classroom in the middle wearing colanders on their head, just getting the, the knowledge pumped right in there. Uh, on the right side, there are firefighters with wings flapping their way to, uh, to put out fires. Now, we do have technologies that address these things in ways that the people of 1900 could not even daydream about. Um, and yet, you know, predicting it exactly is a challenge. So if you get the direction right, you're doing pretty good. All right, so I'm gonna share with you a few of the uh, actual technologies that we see. Um, I've selected a subset here, so there are a lot more, but again, I'm talking about what machine learning can do today and in the near future. Um, all of these things we converged on based on that process I have just described. So now you know how to see the future and I'll tell you what we see there. Um, one of our reports is on natural language generation, and it's one where uh, if you see it in the news, you tend to see stories like this. It is true that the Associated Press actually has uh, somebody whose job title is automation editor, and his job, and I've met him, is to actually oversee the algorithms. So he has no people who work for him. He oversees the software system that generate uh, a fair set of their stories. Um, we built a prototype that generates real estate advertisements, so you tell it the kind of apartment you want to find in New York City or you want to sell in New York City and it writes the ad for you. Uh, it gets really funky when you tell it things that don't exist. So you say, like, I want to um, sell a one-bedroom, 16-bathroom apartment on the Upper East Side with a doorman. Um, and it'll come up with things like, this sun-filled home has a lot of bathrooms. You know, um, but the point of this technology is not that... Uh, that robots are writing articles, but rather that we can take, um, when we think about how we as humans interact with data, you can imagine columns of data or graphs of data, and only a rare set of people get excited about that. Um, you can imagine a graph 
like in the middle here. And that's something and we expect every professional to be able to read a graph, to be able to use Excel, um, if not more. Um, but most people really intuitively understand uh, a language-based interpretation of that data. And that's what this technology gets us. We can go from structured data to a language-based representation. Um, and that means a couple of sentences that say what it is. That's where the power is, is in bringing the understanding of some kind of structured data to a much wider audience through the power of language. Um, and we've seen this actually go on to be implemented, uh, I'll tell you two customers. So one is a bank that used this to automatically generate compliance filings. Um, there's a whole interesting story there. The second one is a, a celebrity fashion magazine that already had a structured JSON feed of celebrity clothing, which believe it or not is a thing that exists. Um, and they were able to quickly create a mobile app where you could uh, you know, uh, get two paragraphs about Kim Kardashian wearing a sweater and then you could buy that sweater um, using this technology. So the same math, very different forms. Um, again, metaphor is here. Um, probabilistic methods for real-time streams. We think there are new architectures that are necessary to understand the world in real time. And when you think about this from an engineering point of view, you go from a metaphor where perhaps we keep our data in some sort of batch environment, and let's say we want to take an average, so we just count up everything in the set, and then we divide it by the number of things in the set, and we have our result. It was pretty straightforward, but depending on how large that is or how distributed it is, it might actually take quite a long time to calculate. But what if we live in a world where our computing device is something the size of my thumbnail, um, and we only have a highly limited amount of memory, and our data comes in as a stream of thousands of events per second, perhaps? Um, how would we calculate an average in that environment? Um, and so the answer here is, of course, that you use an algorithm called reservoir sampling, um, where you have a constrained amount of compute, a constrained amount of memory required. You have a certain number of buckets that you're always probabilistically updating. Um, and you can take the average at any time, and it's just n because you're taking the average of n buckets. Um, what you do have instead of a correct answer is a correct answer with error bars. Now, this is a metaphor for thinking about the design of systems that I like to imagine is the way we will finally build that Star Trek tricorder, um, that we have yet to do that. Uh, instead, here's a, a demonstration of running it across the entire corpus of comments on Reddit, uh, running on one small EC2 instance. Um, and you can see things like similarities in language use between, um, it's like shower thoughts and why I'm single. Um, people talk about the same things in those little corners of the internet. Um, but this is again a metaphor, and of course the graph metaphor here, um, that allowed us to build a system that just would not have been possible if we were constrained by the, the older metaphors of design of architecture. And so there's a ton of power in these probabilistic techniques that we are broadly as a community just really starting to exploit. And then of course I can't give a talk about AI and machine learning today without talking about deep learning. Um, and deep learning, for those of you who have not been hit over the head with it in the last year, is really an evolution of neural networks. That is, uh, neurons that look something like this, uh, many of them together, and then in layers. And the deep is how many layers they are. It's not really a technical term because I've even seen plenty of deep learning papers with one layer deep networks. Um, the reason I mention it here is, again, metaphor. Uh, the brain does not actually work exactly like this, but it was inspired by the way we thought the brain worked in the 1940s and 50s. And in fact, the first neural networks were at uh, Cornell Aeronautical uh, Laboratory. They were hardware, and they could recognize a light turning on and off. Um, and what do we do with them today? Well, they've enabled a huge amount of analysis of rich media that was previously entirely out of reach. Um, so here's a demo where you can actually put in an Instagram filter and it tells you, oh, this person likes to take pictures of, in this case, uh, Ireland. Um, I'm gonna show you it going wrong because I think one of the things that we as uh, machine learning uh, developers and scientists have a responsibility to do is to show the boundaries of technology. Also, I love cheeseburgers. So this is Bleecker Burger, it's a cheeseburger restaurant here in New York. Um, it classified everything pretty well. So the ones on top, it says, oh, these are burgers. And you'll see they're all photos from the side. Um, the ones below, it says, this is food, but it might be a meatloaf, it might be a hot dog, I'm not entirely sure. There's a flagpole in there, which is the only thing they take pictures of that isn't burgers. And then there's crab. So what is crab? Let's go look at that. 
Well, visually, I think we're all pretty smart. We can tell that this neural network has learned that anything that looks like french fries near water or a dock is a crab. Um, and it's pretty sure that it's got some crabs here. Um, and I share this with you, again, just to say that it is our responsibility to not only understand the power of these techniques and these metaphors, but where they go a little weird um, and how we as individuals are responsible for making them not go weird. Um, and I have two more to run through really quickly. So if you apply these same kinds of deep learning uh, techniques to text using um, tools like word embeddings and sentence embeddings, you can start to build things like a system that will take an article and then extract the sentences in the article that intuitively contain the same information. So the sentences on the left here contain the same information as the entire article, more or less. That's all done automatically. It works for any article in the English language because of the way the models were trained, but you could pretty easily develop it for other languages as well. So what does this give us? This gives us a new way to look at not just single pieces of text content, but corpuses of content where you might have 50,000 documents about the same thing and you wanna know uh, what the, the set of viewpoints are. So cluster them and find the viewpoints in that corpus and then summarize each one. And this is now something that you can do pretty easily. The last one ties back to something Emil said earlier today on algorithmic interpretability. So when you build all these black box models, how do you look inside? And first, why do you look inside? So you look inside for two main reasons. One is that the government makes you compliance and uh, regulatory uh, adherence often requires you to be legally able to explain why a system did what it did. And so for those of you who just said, okay, great, now I don't care because I don't work in finance or I don't work in healthcare, um, the other reason you look inside is because sometimes, as I just pointed out, these systems do really weird things and you wanna be able to know why. It allows you to build better systems overall. And so to give you a bit of an intuition here, this is a, a set of, of algorithms that you put on top of your black box algorithms that permute the inputs, look at how the outputs and the classifications change, and then infer which features were significant um, in the uh, black box model. And this gives us the ability to, in this case, go into a telecom churn analysis and figure out not just the probability that a customer will churn, but why and what action you can take. And you can play with actions and see the probabilities changing um, to change that classification and therefore that customer's fate. So this is a really uh, useful set of techniques, not just if you're worried about compliance and regulation. And so a couple, I'm gonna end with a couple of great, uh, my favorite examples of graphs and machine learning. Uh, one is actually from an article that Galad Lotan, the chief uh, data scientist at BuzzFeed created after the uh, inauguration of our president. He did a huge analysis of emoji use on social media and created this representation where you see on the right people who are happy about that inauguration and on the left, everybody else. Um, and you can see that, uh, you know, the way things cluster in this graph visualization tells us the human story. Again, it's the right metaphor for analysis of that particular very emotional moment in time, at least for those of us uh, who are American. Um, another project we did uh, was helping one of the top accounting firms in the world uh, figure out some automation around tax codes. So understanding when the tax code changes in the United States and it does so in a fairly complex way at the federal, state, uh, local level through law changes as well as through changes in judicial interpretation of existing code. Um, we were able to build this model that helped them uh, automatically build a machine learning tool to support their CPAs in their workflows so they didn't miss anything. Um, this was also really exciting. This was a fundamentally new capability in the firm. Um, again, graphs and machine learning. And a similar analysis of uh, how we trade commodities. So news coming in affects things that you have in your investment portfolio. You need to be able to see those connections. Um, this is an example of, uh, of using the power of that metaphor to build tools that enhance the capabilities of human professionals in doing their job even better by getting them the right information at exactly the right moment. And so I'll end with a, with a few uh, points of caution for anyone who's gonna run out and do this. Uh, it is hard, we don't entirely know what we're doing, best practices are emerging, 
Um, if you are building something with technology, I encourage you to think very deeply about the impact of what you build on the world that we live in. Um, and uh, here's a short book I co-authored with DJ and Mike Lukides about uh, the practice of ethics and data science. Again, this is a book that poses questions. It will not give you the answers. Um, but I just encourage you to spend a moment. I think this is the big question that data science practitioners are thinking of of our moment. Like, think about this as you build these technologies. And again, my favorite metaphor, um, which is that technology and machine learning in particular is actually giving us superpowers because it is giving us the technical ability to do things that are out of reach of our cognition as unadorned, unaided human beings. And it's a very exciting moment to be working in this space. So with that, thank you, and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day here. Awesome. awesome. That was uh, absolutely fantastic. Absolutely fantastic. I think there's uh, so much exciting things that you all can do uh, when you combine uh, machine learning and graphs. So really look forward to being back a year from now and talking more about what all of you have built uh, with, the, with, the, um, with these two technologies. So um, we're, uh, this concludes the keynote um, and uh, the normal sessions uh, kick off in uh, half an hour at, at 11. Uh, so I'll just uh, conclude uh, with one, one thing which uh, will be um, by far, actually, the most important thing you'll hear, at least from me uh, today, um, which is that I, I really want Graph Connect to be the best data conference on the planet. Um, but equally, I also want it to be the warmest and the most inclusive and the friendliest conference on the planet. Um, and that, that starts with me and, and all the Neo4j folks out here. But that's also your job. That's also your job. Um, we're all graph people here. We know that relationships are important. Um, don't be tragically isolated documents. <laughs> be graph people. Talk to one another. Strike up a conversation. Just talk about the keynote, your latest thing, what you've been doing with Neo4j, what you want to do. It's something like that. Um, enjoy all the amazing talks that we have. Enjoy the hallway conversations. Um, learn. But most, most importantly, connect. Thank you, everyone. Have a fantastic day.